So there's probably a lot of people that have been following this channel for a while or are on our Discord server or hang out on Twitch that know some of this backstory that I'm going to tell today. But for a lot of the people that are out there that don't know or are new to the channel, or maybe you just stumbled across this randomly, today I'm actually going to sit down and just sit here and talk about being sober, my sobriety. And to be honest, I mean, I'm not really scared, but it is a little out of my comfort zone. I mean, it's one thing to sit and share and be open and vulnerable with other alcoholics and addicts and stuff, but it's something completely different to just put this out there. I mean, anybody's going to be able to see this video and we know how the internet can get. So, I mean, I guess if you have no interest in hearing somebody talk about being sober or their issues with addiction, maybe just skip this video. But for those of you that are interested today, I'm just doing things a little differently. I'm just going to let this camera go and talk, man. And, you know, I've been a roadie for about 15 years, almost my entire adult life. And the majority of that, I was not sober. I was drinking, I was doing drugs, but it didn't really get bad until I started touring in country music. And I've said this a million times, man. I seriously, of all the tours I've done, I think that the country genre in general, in terms of touring, parties harder than any other scene I've ever been in. Rock, metal, you name it. It's country, dude. Like, of course, nobody's out there forcing you to drink or anything like that. But at times it almost felt like it was part of the job. So I'm going to kind of throw it all out there and tell you how touring and country music ultimately made me become sober. Now, before I get into any of this, I just want to lay out what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to kind of tell you guys what it was like, what happened and what it's like now being sober. And I do want to just say, by no means do I think that drinking is bad that anybody watching this video should be sober or change their entire lifestyle. This is a very personal thing. This is my experience. This is why I'm sober. This is why I couldn't handle drugs and alcohol. And I'm just going to tell that story. Don't take anything that's said here like it applies to you unless you feel like it does. Honestly, my hope with this video is that maybe somebody sees this and hey, maybe it helps them out a little bit. But if not, maybe you know, at the very least, you just hear some funny tour stories and stuff like that. But let's just get going here, man. So my experience with drugs and alcohol started at, you know, a fairly young age, I would think. First time I ever got drunk, I was 14. It was off of a six pack of Mike's Hard Lemonade, some real alpha male tough guy shit there. And then started smoking pot a little after, you know, I grew up in a very small farm town outside of Chicago, Illinois where on weekends we had a lot of bonfire parties and barn parties and cornfield parties. And, you know, a lot of us drank a ton and did stuff like that because there was nothing else to do. It was just what we did as teenagers and stuff like that. And it ultimately carried over into college and stuff and, you know, college parties, being a freshman, trying to impress other people. And I always had a sense of, you know, wanting to be you know, approved of, and I wanted to fit in and I wanted people to think I was cool. So, you know, I was that guy at parties. If somebody was like, you know, slam this or do this, whatever, you know, I did it. And for the first few years of that, I never had any incidents. You know, I will say I'm very lucky because growing up in a small town, we didn't have cabs and Ubers weren't a thing. And a lot of people, including myself, I'm very embarrassed to admit this now, but like, you know, driving drunk was a regular thing. I mean, I'm one of my only friends that I grew up with that somehow does not have a DUI. And I'm very grateful and thankful for that. But problems really started around the time I was 20. I'm not going to get into massive detail about it, but when I was 20, I got arrested and alcohol was heavily involved in that. It probably would have never happened if I wasn't drinking. Um, ended up doing, you know, a weekend in a county jail and stuff like that. And after I got out, that was the first moment where I was like, maybe I shouldn't drink anymore. And I think I went like a week without drinking. And then I was like, yeah, I got this, whatever. And combine that with joining my band and being on tour and wanting that stereotypical, just rock star party lifestyle. I mean, we were partying 
all the time. We were still drinking and that sense of, you know, wanting to fit in and be accepted by people was always there. I was the guy on tour that I wanted that reputation on tours of being the guy that could out drink everybody and stuff like that. So almost every tour I did in my twenties, I was pretty much partying and drinking and doing drugs and smoking pot and tons of other stuff. And I would always go through these stints where I thought to myself, like, maybe I have an issue and maybe I need to stop. And I would, and I'd make it a few months. And then I'd convince myself that I'm in control. I can just have one or two and be fine. And that was never the case, man. I would always go back to those drinking habits where it was blackout every night you know, drugs when anybody had them around me. Like, I, I'll be honest, I was never one of those people that went out of my way to buy anything. But uh, if it was there, I would do it. I was definitely a very addictive personality. And there were stupid moments that happened on tour when I became a roadie. Like, you know, I'd be the idiot that got super blackout drunk at after parties and acted like a dumbass and the next day would have to apologize to people. But nothing ever crazy bad, you know, in the early on days of being a roadie. It was just, hey, this kid's stupid and drinks too much. But there started being a lot of red flags, you know, when I started getting into my mid-20s. You know, when I was in my mid-20s, I met Claire, my now wife, and I was really good at hiding how much I drank uh, from her. And I feel like, you know, any good alcoholic <laughs> is very good at making up excuses and lying. But, um, you know, I'd go on tours where we'd have a day off and I'd, you know, drink it like day drink, like two, three in the afternoon. And I'd pass out in my hotel room and my wife would be calling me and checking in to be like, hey, you doing all right? How's your day off? And I wouldn't call her until like five hours later and just be like, oh, I fell asleep and took a nap when in reality I was just smashed in the middle of the day, like not normal behavior. And then more stuff started happening on tours. Um you know, I've, I'm not going to tell the whole story now, but the first time I ever toured Europe, you know, a lot of people that watch this channel are familiar with the Oktoberfest story. Like I got absolutely blackout drunk at Oktoberfest in Munich, Germany. In looking back on it now, what it could have been like a life threatening situation. Like I don't remember still to this day, a lot of the things that happened, um, you know, it's, it's mind blowing thinking about this stuff and, and looking back on it now. But it wasn't until I started working for Dustin Lynch, a country artist who I've told a lot of you guys about that I've worked for. And that'll probably be one of the only names that I drop in this video. A lot of people's names I'm not going to say. Uh, the only reason I bring up Dustin is because he was a big part of this story of, of me becoming sober. But I started working for Dustin in 2015 and I was guitar teching for him and the other players. And that was my first dose of like, this is a party. Like, this doesn't feel like we're touring to work. This feels like we're touring for the after party every single night. I mean, on country tours, they specifically have like one of the dressing rooms blocked off to be the after show party room where they have lights set up and music and any kind of beer and liquor you could think of. And those, that was, I would got through my days because I was so excited to just go fucking party, man. And that's what we did. Every night, man, I was, I started getting blackout drunk and I convinced myself that I could not sleep well on tour unless I was smashed and I'd make up those excuses. And I'd even have other crew guys that are like, Hey man, you know, maybe you should slow down a little. And I was like, Oh, I don't sleep as good if I'm not, you know, wasted. And again, it became that thing where, you know, I, I started not calling my wife at night because I just wanted to get to that party and drink and, you know, full honesty to everybody. And I've, I've talked to my wife about this, like never had any moments where, you know, I cheated on her or anything like that. It was just, I cared more about getting fucked up than I cared about really anything else. Now I will say I was good at it, not affecting my job. Like I would always wait usually until we were done with a show before I got drunk. But at that point, it's like playing catch up with everybody else. It's like I need to get as drunk as everybody else as fast as possible, which led to me getting way more drunk than everybody. And it just started getting kind of out of hand. And there were a couple moments on the tour where like Dustin, his tour manager did ask me like, dude, are you, are you okay? Is there an issue? 
And I always said no. I was like, oh, I just maybe take the party in a little too far. And uh, the big, the big sobering moment for me, and I'll, I'll tell this story to the best of my knowledge in full, was in uh, January of 2017. We went down to Cancun, Mexico, because every year there's a big country music festival down there at an all-inclusive resort where they have shows Wednesday through Saturday, all the beer, all the liquor, everything's free. And we'd go down there and only have to do one or two shows. So the rest of the time we're absolutely partying. Well, on this specific year on the way down on the plane to Mexico, we just decided to drink and me more than others. And I got super messed up. Like I was still coherent when we got to the airport in Cancun. Well, coherent enough that I remember what was happening. And there was an incident that occurred with somebody that worked for Dustin where I was upset at this person. And there were many incidents before this that kind of led up to this, but I it started getting like very angry while I was drinking. So I kept drinking and we drank from the whole ride from the airport to the resort where we were staying. By the time we got there, I was pretty much blackout drunk already. And I barely remember getting to the hotel and I was going to go to my room and I saw a bunch of crew guys at the hotel bar. So I go in there and I sit down, start ripping tequila shots like crazy, start drinking beers like crazy. And at this point, I'm on like full blackout autopilot mode. And the rest of this story that happened this night is all hearsay um, from other people that were there. I honestly don't remember any of this to this day. But um, this person that worked for Dustin that I mentioned uh, a minute ago that I was angry at uh, apparently walked into the bar. And when I saw them in my blackout state, I just went into like Hulk mode, like rage. I guess I got out of my bar seat, went up to him, started talking shit, uh, pushed him, grabbed him, all this stuff. It, it took, I, from what I heard, it took a, a crew guy or two to like get me away from this guy and get to my room. And I wake up the next morning, kind of terrified because like, you know, you wake up from a blackout drunk like that and you don't realize, like, I didn't know where I was. Like I woke up in a bed that I didn't know in a room that I didn't know. And my first immediate thought was, where's my phone? Where's my wallet? They were both there. And then I realized, oh, we're in Mexico, you know, cool. And I was like, wow, what a crazy night. And I woke up to text messages from people in our crew that were like, you know, whatever you do, stay away from this person for the rest of the trip. Like, don't do it. And I'm, I, I had no idea what was going on. I was like, okay. So me being a dumbass, texted that person, said, hey man, I don't remember what happened last night, but people said something happened, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they basically accused me of ruining their trip to Mexico and called me an asshole and said, don't talk to me. And I was like, okay, I have no idea what's going on. And that morning we were doing an acoustic show at, at the pool at this resort and everybody, like when I started seeing all my crew guys were just looking at me like, like I was like contagious, like I had a disease. They were just giving me looks and I'm like, what happened? So my production manager at the time explained to me what happened, told me how big of an asshole I was. And, you know, I, I kind of at that moment was like, dude, you know, maybe I have a, a huge issue here. But being the alcoholic that I am, that thought left my mind like five minutes later. So while we're setting up to do this acoustic show, I was so hung over that I just reached for the cooler to grab a beer. And my production manager at the time, I will say his name because he is probably the person that's really, I don't even know if he knows this, but he's probably the person that stopped me from ever drinking again. Uh, Eric Rogers is the name of the guy. He was my production manager at the time. He puts his hand on my arm and he goes, don't do it. Just, just get, get through the day and don't do it. And I'm like, okay. So I didn't drink there. We do the show. It was miserable. I was hungover. I'm pretty sure I had alcohol poisoning. I was hallucinating and all this other weird stuff. And uh, we finished the show and I go back to my room and I literally laid in my bed all day. And I, I think it was the first legitimate time I was having either alcohol withdrawals or, you know, it was, it was crazy. I was like trembling. I, I was sweating like crazy, shaking. I had a horrible headache. I feel like I was hallucinating things. 
when I would go to sleep, I was having the craziest dreams and I'd wake up still just trembling and I didn't know what the fuck was going on. And I remember calling my dad and like kind of telling him what happened. And he was just like, dude, maybe you have a problem. And that was the first time I was like, I, I, maybe I do. And maybe I should stop drinking. And I did. Like, I really, I haven't drank since then. And it was interesting because I had made up my mind right then and there, like, I'm going to stop drinking. Now, I wasn't thinking about doing a recovery program or rehab or anything. I was like, I'm just going to stop drinking. And then when we got back to the States, I got called into um, Dustin's production office while we were doing a show and, and his managers were there that day. And I was, I'm, I'm getting fired. Like, I'm, there's, there's no way I'm not getting fired after this incident. But I didn't. And the craziest thing, and it's probably going to make me a little emotional thinking about this right now. The craziest thing is that they weren't mad. I expected full on wrath of like, dude, you like you're acting like an idiot. And the person that I assaulted was in this room. And I expected, again, to, to just be chewed out. And instead, every person in there, including that person, was just like, they came from a place of true caring, like even like Dustin was there as tour manager, management, everybody. And we're like, are you OK? Like we're, we're legitimately worried about you at this point. And um, I, I, I mean, you can see that that was that was the moment where I was like, I'm done. Like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like. I've been acting like an idiot. I'm risking my job. I'm probably risking my marriage if I start acting like this at home. And like I said, I, I drank a lot at home. I was just good at hiding it from, from my wife. And, you know, I told the guys, I was like, I'm going to stop for real. Like I, I may need your help. Um, I don't want you guys to change anything you're doing. Like, don't feel like you can't drink around me, but I'm not going to drink anymore. Um, and then when I got home, I told Claire and, um, you know, still to this day, man, I, I it fucking eats me up. Like when I told Claire, I was going to stop drinking and I was, I was going to be sober. Um, she, she looked at me and she said, I'm, I'm, I'm relieved that you're telling me that because I, I know you've had a problem and I, um, I didn't know how to bring it up to you. She goes, it was getting, it was getting to a point where I, I couldn't tell when you were sober or drunk anymore because you were drinking so much. And I'm like, that's, that's a fucking wake up call, dude. Um, so I haven't drank since then, but being the addictive personality that I am, I just replaced all my drinking with smoking weed. And I started getting stoned all the fucking time, like all the time, any excuse. And I was never a big weed smoker before, but then it's like we'd get home from tour and I'd have nothing to do. So I would just wake up and smoke weed. And then a couple years down the line, um, I started, you know, thinking to myself like a couple years of no drinking. I was like, I'm cool. As long as I don't drink, I'm cool. I can do anything else and I'm fine. So if we were on tours where somebody had like prescription pain pills or anything like that, I started taking some of those from people. And then one of the, my lows was, Claire had back surgery at one point and they gave her, I can't remember what it was, but it was some strong painkiller. And I used to sneak those from the cabinet at night and she, she noticed and she asked me, have you been taking my pain pills? And me again, being that horrible addict mind, I blamed it on her. I was like, no, you probably took them in the middle of the night because you were in pain and you just forgot. I was like, don't blame this on me. But no, it was absolutely fucking me. I was just lying and making excuses like I do. So fast forward to the pandemic starting. Um, I was terrified to be home, to be honest, because while I wasn't drinking, I was still smoking weed and I was taking stuff and. I, I was just, I need something more than this. Like, I, I don't know if I'm going to fall into my old habits, if I'm at home while we're in quarantine and stuff. So I, um, one day I just happened to be talking to one of my friends on the phone about my feelings about this and my, my fears about this. 
And he connected me with a friend of his and said, Hey, you know, I don't know if you know this guy, but you know, call him and talk to him about this. And, uh, this person has become one of my, one of my best friends. Like I love this person to death and they helped me get into a recovery program for, you know, alcohol and drugs and stuff like that. And as of filming this video, since the pandemic starting, um, as of March 17th, 2020, I am sober. Like I was able to stop taking drugs, smoking weed, you know, alcohol, everything. And it, it, it's the best thing I've ever done for myself. I'm not going to lie. Um, life has gotten so much better. It's been hard. It's been hard to admit that I had issues. It's been hard to deal with some of the things that have happened in my past and stuff like that. But being open and being honest with people and getting it out there has helped me immensely. And like I said at the start of this video, man, I don't necessarily think sobriety is for everybody. Um, I don't think that every single person that drinks needs to be sober because not everybody probably has the issues that I have. There are people out there that are able to have a drink or two. My wife, perfect example. She'll have like alcohol once every month, if that. I'm, I've just never been that kind of person. And I have people tell me all the time, they're like, oh, dude, just, you know, control it. Just have one or two. It's like, I can't, I, I, I can't. And it's hard to describe that to somebody that doesn't understand. And, you know, I've had people on tours tell me, like, I don't understand how you can drink like that. Like when we go out to bars and stuff, it's like, I don't understand how you can just like slam all these beers or when we're ready to leave, you just chug an entire full beer that you had just ordered. And I was like, well, think about it this way. I don't understand how you can leave a half empty glass on the table full of alcohol. To me, that's crazy. Like you ordered it, drink it, you know? So I think that's the best kind of explanation that I can um, use for somebody that doesn't really understand that alcoholism, that addiction. But again, it, this is a very personal thing. This is what was best for me. This is what I had to do to get my life better. And then, you know, our daughter was born in March of 2021. And to me, the, I mean, that's, I, I fucking absolutely love that as long as I keep up with my sobriety and protect my sobriety for myself, my daughter's never going to have to see her dad do any of this dumb shit that I ever used to do when I was drinking and doing drugs. So, you know, life's fucking good, man. This is the best thing I could have ever done for myself. And looking back on it, you know, had I not been on that tour in country music, had I not been surrounded by those people, maybe I would have never wound up sitting here and talking to you guys about it. Maybe way worse stuff has happened because that's one of the things I tried to tell myself when I first got sober talking to people about it was I was like, well, I hear stories from other people about how they've gotten DUIs, lost their marriages, their jobs, stuff like that. That never happened to me. And a super, super wise thing that somebody said to me was yet. They're like, think about your alcoholism and addiction as being on an elevator going down. You can press stop and get off at any time. But eventually, you're going to hit that bottom floor. You're just fortunate enough that you decided to ask for help before that happened. And that's something that I'm just always going to be grateful for, to be honest, man. And um, yeah, you know, now, 2022, getting towards the end of the year, I'm over two years completely clean, sober, um, you know, life's fucking awesome, dude. I couldn't imagine having this happy of a life sober. You know, I always wondered like, how am I going to have fun when I'm not drinking? How am I going to go do these things that I used to do without drinking and doing drugs? And the answer is simple. You just keep doing them and you have fun. Not the drugs and the alcohol, those things that you liked. Sorry, that was worded very wrong. Um, I still go out to bars with my friends. I go to hockey games with my friends that are drinking. I just don't do those things because trust me, it's for everybody's best interest that I'm not fucking drinking and doing drugs. And anybody that I've ever toured with will probably tell you that as well. 
Life's fucking fantastic. I have a beautiful daughter. I have a wife that fucking loves me for who I am. That's put up with tons of my shit. I've, you know, my business connections have gotten better. When I get offers for tours and people find out I'm sober, they're fucking stoked because they know that I can be reliable. Like not to say that anybody else that's drinking can't be reliable, but it's a good feeling for me to know that I can be present and be reliable and, and help other people. And helping other people has been a fantastic experience through all of this. And I hope that by telling the story, maybe I've helped one of you guys. Um, if anybody out there is having their own issues or has any questions or thoughts, nobody can tell you that you're an alcoholic or an addict except for yourself. Nobody. It's the only thing that's going to get you sober is if you yourself decide you need to get sober. And that was something that I realized, you know, early on in my sobriety. I need to work this for me. First and foremost, everybody else around me that I love and that I care about, yes, I want to do it for them too. But most importantly, I'm sober to be me. I quit drinking and doing drugs because I don't like the person that I am doing those things. Don't get me wrong. I had fucking great times drinking and doing drugs and hanging out with people in that scene. But for me, it just got to a point where it wasn't fun. And this is what I needed to change about myself to just be a good person and have the best life that I can possibly live. I'm going to take a break really quick and I'm going to figure out how I'm going to wrap this up. Okay. So for anybody watching this, that made it through all this, that listened to everything I had to say about my story and experience. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Again, this was a little weird for me to do knowing that this is just going on the internet for anybody to see. But I will say, if any of this resonated with you, I mean, I'm always available to talk to anybody about it. Leave a comment. If you don't want to leave a comment, join us on Discord. Our Discord server does have a sober lifestyle channel on it that people can talk about their issues if they're comfortable enough. And it's not just drugs and alcohol. We can talk about anything. Um, you know, with anything that we're we're battling in life, whether it's any kind of addiction or drugs or anything like that, I feel like the most important thing to do is to talk and ask for help. I feel like there are sometimes, you know, situations where it's stigmatized. Uh, people feel like it's weak to ask for help or talk about it. Um, it's fucking bullshit, dude. It's, it's all bullshit, man. If you need the help, reach out and ask. I mean, and there will always be somebody there for you to help you through those things. And if they're not, fuck them. They're, they're not a real friend. Somebody that cares about you and loves you will be there for you if you come to them and ask for help. So, um, again, man, it's kind of felt great, a little cathartic sitting here and talking to all you guys about this again, um, just to reiterate, I'm not trying to convince people to get sober here again. This is a very personal thing. This was my experience, but if there was anybody out there that felt anything or it resonated with them, or you might have questions about yourself. Give it a thought, man. I, I really hope that this video maybe reaches some people that might feel alone and give them the encouragement to ask for that help that I eventually did. So uh, if you want to join that Discord server that I was talking about with that sober channel on it, I will have links below. I will also have links below to all my social media. Again, I will always talk to anybody that ever feels like they, they need help or want to talk about any issues like this. But uh, I feel a little emotionally exhausted at this point. So that's going to be it from me. Thank you guys very much uh, to everybody that always returns to the channel and views all this stuff. Thank you to anybody that might be new that made it this far. Thank you very much. Feel free to click subscribe and follow along. And man, just wherever you are in the world, be safe, be kind to each other. And thank you for watching and I'll be back soon.